That's what you do when you send out a reconnaissance patrol. You go put some bait out there and wait for the enemy to fire on him. Then you know where the enemy is. Roger, the bandit here says one Surviving a determined enemy was difficult. Surviving the incompetence of command often proved impossible. The neutrality of Laos was a farce that tied the hands of the American military during the Vietnam War. The Kennedy administration, reeling from their humiliating failure to overthrow the Cuban government at the Bay of Pigs, turned their attention to Laos. In July 1962, 14 nations signed an agreement in Geneva guaranteeing the neutrality of Laos. An agreement the North Vietnamese, to no one's surprise, ignored from day one. Nevertheless, the administration touted it as a tremendous foreign policy success that would prevent the spread of communism throughout Southeast Asia. For years, American ground troops, forbidden to enter Laos, engaged in operations reeling from ambush to ambush, their frustrated commanders sounding like the British during the American Revolution, complaining that the enemy wouldn't come out and fight. Of course, well known to everyone, the enemy, tens of thousands of them, were in bomb-proof caves and bunkers a few miles across the border, secure from ground attack by a piece of paper. They constructed the logistics system that fed the war in the south, known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. By 1965, with thousands of North Vietnamese troops and hundreds of tons of supplies moving south through Laos, something had to be done. For a job that demanded nothing less than a combined arms task force, President Johnson, fearing escalation, authorized the Army to begin sending small units of Americans and indigenous fighters into Laos to disrupt the supply lines. The Americans, drawn from the Army's special forces, wore no dog tags or uniform insignia. If killed or captured, the government would deny that these six-foot-tall English-speaking soldiers were Americans. It was a dangerous job. Alerted by their helicopter insertions, the North Vietnamese would relentlessly hunt them down. Security for these operations was a major concern. Knowing the MACV headquarters in Saigon, commanded by General Westmoreland, was riddled with spies, the orders for these missions came directly from the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon to a nondescript building in Saigon that contained the deceptively named Studies and Observations Group, known as SOG. From SOG headquarters, orders were sent to the forward operating bases for their implementation. These security precautions were completely undone by the U.S. State Department. Even though the panhandle of Laos was occupied North Vietnamese territory, they claimed that the cross-border operations would cause diplomatic fallout. In fact, their concern was with domestic political fallout. Using authority left over from the neutrality negotiations, the Laotian ambassador was given direct supervision over SOG's activities. As a result, mission information that was considered too sensitive to share with Westmoreland was floating around the embassy in Vientiane, which was also riddled with spies. William A. Sullivan, the ambassador from 1964 to 1969, constantly abused his authority by arbitrarily limiting how far SOG could go into Laos and how many men they could take. Perhaps it never occurred to him that his restrictions made it easier for the enemy to hunt down SOG units. More likely, he just didn't care. In the summer of 1968, I had a hatch of force lined up by the runway at Mylock waiting for the transport to come in to take us across the fence. And a captain comes out and he tells me the ambassador to Laos says you can only take 12 guys. And I'm like, that's bullshit. And he's like, no, you can only take 12 guys. Well, I've been on enough recon operations that I know I'm a lot more comfortable in Laos with three dozen mercenaries and buy them 60 machine guns than I am trying to sneak around with 12 guys. But there's really no sense in arguing about it because this guy, the ambassador, thinks he's God. So we waited for the transport to come in and we ran the mission with 12 people. In October 1961, President Kennedy raised the profile of the Army Special Forces 
by authorizing the wearing of the Green Beret. In 1962, he wrote a much-publicized White House memorandum stating, The Green Beret is again becoming the symbol of excellence, a badge of courage, a mark of distinction in the fight for freedom. The Army quickly discovered that the Green Berets were an effective tool to recruit adventurous young men into their ranks. Four-star General and Army Chief of Staff Harold K. Johnson didn't share their enthusiasm. In 1966, he publicly stated that Special Forces soldiers were fugitives from responsibility who found a haven where their actions weren't scrutinized too carefully. The Professional Officer Corps adopted his views for the most part. With this distrust of Special Forces, the Pentagon ordered that SOG's pre-mission briefings for cross-border operations be limited to intelligence information that had been developed on previous SOG missions. This was done to prevent what they called information bias. Simply put, the Army feared that if a team was told there was NVA truck traffic on a road, they were more likely to report they observed truck traffic the result of this decision was disastrous for SOG's ground operators. In July 1967, SOG attempted to insert a 100-man company into a North Vietnamese Army stronghold in Laos. Four helicopters and two fixed-wing aircraft were shot down, and half of the fighting force was lost. The presence of an NVA anti-aircraft battalion in the target area had been withheld. During 1967, mission tempo picked up. Teams were being inserted blind and casualties were high. Most of those killed were Sergeant E-7s with lengthy Special Forces service, many dating back to the 50s. You could lose a bunch of Spec 4s and 1st Lieutenants and would hardly be noticed, but in a close-knit Special Forces community where everybody knew or had heard of everybody else, word of the losses of senior NCOs spread quickly. By the end of 1967, seasoned Special Forces soldiers from Okinawa to Batolts knew that SOG was a good place to get killed. At 5th Special Forces Group headquarters in the Trang, senior NCO replacements were openly told to stay out of SOG, while soldiers right out of training group were encouraged to volunteer. Then came the Tet Offensive. On 31 January 1968, during the Lunar New Year truce, Viet Cong main force units simultaneously launched surprise attacks on more than 100 South Vietnamese population centers. The American and South Vietnamese forces were caught off guard, although most of the attacks were quickly put down and many Viet Cong main force units were devastated. There had been a massive intelligence failure. Commanding General William Westmoreland and his staff immediately went in to cover their ass mode insisting the attacks were merely a diversion. As fingers were pointed, fighting raged in the old imperial capital of Wei. Three days later, Walter Cronkite informed the nation the war was lost. The intelligence failure lay on Westmoreland's desk. Weeks before the attack, he received reports detailing the massive increase in southbound truck traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the last quarter of 1967. From a normal movement of less than 500 trucks in September, traffic increased to over 6,000 in December. Truck traffic was routed from the Magia Pass to west of Jepang, far beyond the limits of SOG infiltration set by the Laotian ambassador. After the offense of SOG came under intense pressure to gather intelligence on the North supply lines, in 1968 operations officers at the FOBs were urged to send more and more teams across the border. During periods of good weather, as many teams as possible were inserted into Laos with little concern that if multiple teams got into trouble at the same time, SOG did not have the resources to rescue them. Casualties were getting out of hand. Senior NCOs left over from the previous year, and those few who were still volunteering continued to suffer high losses but most replacements were now newly minted Green Berets in their early 20s. It was not unusual for these soldiers to be awarded the Combat Infantry Badge and the Purple Heart after their first mission. They performed well above expectations. Fact was, once you had the physical stamina, expertise in small unit patrolling, and most importantly, the courage to venture into such a hostile environment, the only way you learned to run operations in Laos 
was to run operations in Laos. The trick was to stay alive long enough to get good at it. To disseminate SOG's findings to other American units, their after-action reports were sanitized and included in the daily intelligence summaries. Enemy encounters were attributed to friendly paramilitary forces. A SOG recon team could be in an hours-long running gunfight with an enemy of much greater strength, suffer casualties, perform heroic acts of self-sacrifice, and eventually be rescued by hanging on ropes a hundred feet below a helicopter and the intelligence report would read, A friendly paramilitary unit engaged an estimated NVA reinforced platoon at coordinate such and such. That was it. Hardly worth the trouble of putting a grease pencil notation on a map. Questions were being asked by SOG's operators. From Dawson's War. How about all the supplies we stopped from coming down the trail, Dawson asked. The NVA moves tons a day. We don't make a dent in that, Sergeant Fallon replied. Then what's the point in going out and getting our ass shot off? That's a good question. By the time your kids are grown and you can tell them what you did, I'm sure they'll have come up with something. In early summer, near the end of his tour, Colonel Singlab expressed concern. There was great pressure from Mr. McNamara directly for us to increase the number of those teams. We were losing far more men than, than I felt was uh, worthwhile. The special assistant for counterinsurgency and special activities and his staff at the Pentagon also began to question the viability of the cross-border operations. The dedicated staff officers at SOG headquarters in Saigon were deeply opposed to terminating the program. They had spent hundreds of hours during the day slaving away in air-conditioned offices, and at night, they worked diligently to develop a deeper understanding of the Vietnamese people. They were willing to sacrifice going home to their lovely wives and precious children to ensure the program's success. As luck would have it, the staff began to notice overlooked signals intelligence reports that confirmed what their ground operators had reported. The North Vietnamese were diverting hundreds, maybe thousands of frontline soldiers from South Vietnam to form a special commando group in Laos, specifically to counter SOG's operations. Then on August 23rd, sappers attacked FOB-4 at Da Nang, with devastating results. It remains the greatest single-action loss of Special Forces lives to this day. For the enemy to take extreme action, SOG must be causing them grave damage, the staff officers reasoned. The cross-border operations intelligence gathering results may not have been worth the cost in lives lost, but since their very presence in Laos was tying up a large amount of the enemy's resources, the operations would continue. As 1969 began, SOG consolidated its base structure by closing the Mylock launch site that was still under construction and FOB-1 just south of Way. The remaining FOBs were renamed Command and Control North, Central, and South. In late January, I arrived to Command and Control North from Mylock, where I had been running a hatchet force platoon for seven months. This picture was taken shortly after that. The others had been running recon out of the now defunct FOB-1. We were getting reacquainted. I had spent my first month in country at FOB-1 and had been assigned to carry the radio for Sergeant Boggs on a thankfully aborted recon mission into a death trap target designated Oscar 8. Sergeant Eldon Bargewell, who would survive to later serve with Delta Force at Desert One and retire as a major general, was telling us that our new CNC North commander, who had the ominous code name of Iceman, said that SOG was finally doing their job. They were getting people killed. Others thought it had come from someone at our Saigon headquarters. Regardless of who said it or if it was actually said, the second part of the statement was certainly true. During the past year, all of us had been wounded at least once, and half of our operators had been killed. In the beginning, a perfect recon mission was one where a team was inserted, undetected, discovered valuable information, and withdrew without the enemy ever knowing they were there. By 1969, the Ho Chi Minh Trail wasn't a secret anymore. The locations of North Vietnamese Army units in Laos were well known, down to at least the regimental level. 
supply tonnage was calculated. Now teams were being inserted for the purpose of making the enemy commit resources to hunt them down. At this point, you might think someone would have had a meeting explaining the change to SOG's ground operators so they could make the necessary tactical and equipment changes. But that didn't happen. Back at the Pentagon, reasoning that if it ain't broke, don't fix it, the decision was made not to inform the FOBs of what they carefully called a change in emphasis. So teams continued to place wiretaps and hunt for pipelines, and operators kept getting wounded or killed, pushing the limits, trying to accomplish these, at best, secondary objectives. I was back in the States on leave in May and watched the Battle of Hamburger Hill unfold on the nightly news. By the time I returned to Vietnam, I knew that Nixon was turning the fighting over to the Vietnamese and had ordered the end of all American offensive operations. While U.S. infantry divisions began packing up and heading home, SOG just kept banging away, as if it was 1967. No matter how many of you tell me in the comments that your uncle was in SOG, it is estimated that only a total of 600 American Special Forces soldiers ran cross-border operations. How bad do casualties get? From July of 1966 till May of 1971, SOG was ordered to infiltrate a single target west of the Ashaw Valley nine times. It was called Oscar 8. During those operations, about 200 men were involved, including U.S. Special Forces, mercenaries, and air crew. Eighty-one of them were killed or went missing in action. For comparison, of the 1,800 men from the 101st Airborne Division engaged at Hamburger Hill, 72 were lost. Twenty-nine years after McPhee Sog was disbanded, the unit was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Mistakenly calling us the Special Operations Group, the citation sums up our accomplishments as follows. Special Operations Group's cross-border operations proved an effective economy of force, compelling the North Vietnamese Army to divert 50,000 soldiers to rear area security duties far from the battlefields of South Vietnam. Had we not been sworn to secrecy after the war, I doubt if any of us would have described our mission as giving the enemy something to shoot at in Laos so they couldn't go shoot Marines in South Vietnam. You see this guy? His name is Howard Sugar. By 1971, the concentration of enemy troops in our target areas was making it difficult to infiltrate by helicopter. So on 11 October 1971, 20, maybe 21-year-old Sergeant Sugar, acting as the assistant team leader, jumped from a C-130 into the night sky and skydived 13,000 feet into the enemy-infested jungle. It sounds insane, all the more so because America's role in the war was almost over. Fortunately, everyone survived and they were successfully extracted. Why'd he do it? Howard Sugar was a soldier. He volunteered for SOG. You'll find my book Dawson's War worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of Mac V. SOG's operations, Dawson's War is a story of five men, three Americans, and two Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries. I'll take you with us for a year. You'll get your fair share of gunfights in Laos, because we did. But SOG was so much more than gunfights. SOG was a brotherhood. And unless you experience the camaraderie these men shared, you really don't know SOG. Through Dawson's War, these five men will become your friends. And like I do, you'll miss them when it's over. In the end, you'll be able to answer SOG's most asked question. What kind of men ran these dangerous missions? Get a copy today at Amazon. Thanks. And as always, like and subscribe. It helps.